We are uh, in a series about words and the, and, the, and the power of our words. Last week we, uh, we looked at the text that says that the power of life and death is in the tongue, is in our, our words. Our, our words have the power to build up or destroy. Our words have the power to help or to hurt. And uh, our focus last week was particularly on how that can affect other people. Today, I want to focus on the impact our words have on us when we talk to ourselves. You know, I was looking this up to see whether it's okay to talk to yourself. I thought maybe it meant you're insane. But uh, psychologists say actually it's a good way to stay sane, <laughs> is to speak to yourself truths and realities uh, that, that sort of go against the stuff that we face in life. It's not it's not crazy to talk to ourselves. In fact, a lot of mental health practitioners acknowledge that it's really, really beneficial. And uh, in the Bible, there are several examples of self-talk. One that we may be familiar with is Psalm 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. We all know this one. And all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And do not forget all his benefits. That's uh, what the psalmist is doing here. He's, he's talking to himself. He's reminding himself of God's goodness, speaking to himself, to his soul. You know, in Hebrew thought, the word soul uh, means just ourself. It, it, it refers to our whole person. Unlike in Greek thought, where soul meant the internal part of us as opposed to the physical outward part of us, Hebrews didn't see it that way. Uh, and so when the psalmist says, oh my soul, he means really, oh myself. And perhaps the best known example of biblical self-talk is Psalm 42. And that's going to be our text for us to think about today. We're going to read the whole psalm. There's 11 verses in it, so let's get started. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for streams of waters, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to, <clears throat> say to me all day long, where is this God of yours? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. It's a picture of a uh, uh, one of the festivals at the temple. And then he moves into this d encouragement thing. Why, my soul, are you downcast? He's talking to himself. Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And then he switches back. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? You may recognize there Jesus on the cross as his enemies taunted him, saying, let him save himself or let God save him. Why my soul, he comes back to this sort of self-talk. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is a, this is a song of questions. Did you notice that? When and where and why? You know, when will I meet with God? Uh, uh, where is your God? God, why have you forgotten me? And then speaking to himself, why so downcast, O oh my soul? It's also a song of contrast, and I, I hope you picked up on that. Back, that's why I had us read the whole song. Back and forth between complaint and remembrance and <laughs> encouragement, and then to, to, to back to complaint, and then over to encouragement, and then to complaint again, and then ending with encouragement. And I, we're kind of tempted to say, dude, make up your mind, you know. But isn't this how uh, most of us experience the challenges of life? This emotional back and forth, this emotional up and down, maybe you can find yourself in that sort of swinging back and forth between one thought 
and another. And, and what the psalmist is doing in the midst of all of this is he's pouring out your, his heart. He says to us, pour out your heart to the Lord. These things I remember as I pour out my soul to the Lord. These, these emotional contrasts are part of the process of self-talk. This is the first point I want us to get. These contrasts, back and forth, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And then the very next statement, I'm really bummed out. Uh, this is, he's not ignoring, the psalmist is not ignoring what's happening around him. He's talking about it. He's describing it. You know, some, I, I know there's a stream of thought that says you should never talk about anything negative. He shouldn't be saying these things. I, I actually read a commentary where the writer said, the psalmist is wrong to talk this way. And I scratched my head and thought, well, then why did the Holy Spirit include it in the text? I think this is, it's just telling us that people go through these things and God is with us in the ups and he's with us in the downs, no matter where we find ourselves. This, this writer's talk and the way he speaks about this is not triumphalism. You may not have heard of that term, but triumphalism is this, this idea that we only ever acknowledge victory. We only ever talk about uh, positive things. We never speak about problems or pain, or if we do, we only do so in a cursory kind of way. It's sort of like the preacher I heard one day years ago, and he was super positive, and, and he made this, I'm not against being positive, but he got up and said, I never have a bad day. And I went, whoa. Oh, either he is a big fat liar or I am some kind of spiritual loser because I, I don't live that. I have bad days. I don't know about you, but I sometimes have bad days. And I, I hear that now and I go, come on, Paul, the great apostle, had bad days. You know, he's clear about it. He says, I, 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 I labored among you. He said to the Ephesian elders on the beach in Miletus, I labored among you with, 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 uh, with faithfulness and with many tears. He said to the Philippians, I've warned you before. I warn you again now with tears that some, do, uh, uh, some live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He cried a lot. J uh, due to emotional pain he experienced, Paul had bad days. Hey, you know what? Jesus had bad days. He said to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. I feel like I'm dying. That's Jesus. So, you know, I never have a bad day. Well, Mo, you're doing better than Paul and Jesus. What I'm, try what I'm saying with this, I mean, there's self-talk. We, we're we're going to be talking about being positive and speaking the truth, but we should never do that as a way of denial. Like my problems don't matter. Like my pain is irrelevant. Years ago, there was a song on the radio, uh, it's a, I call it the love song of denial, where the guy says, I'm not in love, remember this song? So don't forget it, it's just a silly phase I'm going through, ooh, 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 ooh. I keep your picture upon the wall, it hides a nasty stain that's lying there. Anybody remember this song? If you're over 50, you know? You know, I'm not in love. Of course he's in love. It comes through every line of denial. It's like the person who says, I'm not shouting, you know, that kind of, well, I got, I'm going to kind of paraphrase that song. I call it the life song of denial. It goes like this. I have no problems. I am just fine. I've never had a bad day. Can't you see the tears I'm crying are from an onion? Or maybe I've just got an allergy. <laughs> We're talking about self-talk, but I want to be clear. Self-talk faces the reality of pain and expresses it, okay? I will remember you, he says, from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon. What's that, what's that all about? The Jordan River up by, the, by uh, the Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon's the tallest mountain in the area, so high, always rains up at the top, and it, the water runs off and it feeds the Jordan. Well, we think of the Jordan River maybe as this peaceful, placid stream right around Jericho, but the, the writer's talking about the Whitewater Jordan. He's talking, about, he's talking about this kind of river right here, okay? Deep calls to deep. I mean, there's the psalmist right there in his kayak. You see him right there. And, uh, you know, the, the scripture says up by that part of the Jordan, he's remembering the deep calls to deep. That deep calls to deep is not about wisdom. 
It's not about your stomach growling when you're hungry. My mom always just say that because her stomach growled a lot. It would go, and she'd look at me and she'd say, deep calls to deep. But that's not what it's about. <laughs> deep refers to chaos of some kind. In the Hebrew language, in Hebrew thought, the depths of the ocean and the wildness of the ocean was, were symbols of chaos. The Message Bible says it this way, chaos calls to chaos to the tune of white water rapids. I mean, what he's describing is life when it's chaotic, when it's unpredictable, you know, life thrown off balance. I think this describes the last 12 months for most of us. We've been on a white water ride. <laughs> And, and my, my point here is this, that the, the psalmist doesn't just jump straight to positive self-talk. He's, he's acknowledging the pain, and he lets his self-talk express that pain and, to, and, and the bewilderment and the sense of chaos. And the psalmist is really doing what psychologists recommend. To, to name the things we fear, to name the things that are making us sad or angry or a shame, to talk about our negative emotions and, and experiences to ourselves and perhaps to trusted friends or counselors. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't mean we wallow in them. We're not going to go just live in a hot tub of problems. I don't mean that, but we acknowledge their reality and identify them. And, and I found this so helpful in my own life. My counselors taught me this, that, uh, that I'll just, when I'm feeling off, when I'm feeling down, I will start to itemize what is it that I'm feeling exactly and why am I feeling that way? And it's funny because it's like I kind of step out from myself and look at myself and I find it helpful for me to be more objective rather than just in the spin cycle of my emotions if you know what I'm talking about. And so the psalmist says these things as he pours out his heart. But here's, here's the next point. He doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He says, why so downcast, O my soul? While acknowledging the challenge, the chaos, the fear, the pain, he says to himself, that's not the whole story. And no matter what any of us are going through and the, and the challenges we're facing, that's not the whole story. There's more going on than just those things. And this is where I come to my next point, that we've, you've got to talk to yourself. You got to talk to yourself. If you're familiar with the, with the uh, show Parks and Rec, there's a guy named Tom Haverford with his friend Donna, and, uh, and they say, treat yourself, you know. Well, I'm modifying it. I'm Tom, Pastor Tom Haverford, and I'm saying to all of you, talk to yourself. We got to learn to talk to ourselves more and more. This is what the psalmist is doing when he says in verse 11, Why my soul so downcast, why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You know, this, this statement is meant to be an encouragement. We should never read this verse as some kind of reprimand. You know, why are you so downcast, stupid soul? How dare you be downcast? Your depression is an insult to God. You know what? I have found this approach to be counterproductive, all right? I was discouraged before, but now I've got one more reason to be discouraged. Now I'm discouraged about being discouraged. You ever met people, they're afraid because they're afraid, they're depressed because they're depressed. Now I'm discouraged because I'm discouraged. Let's not be confession sheriffs on ourselves. And let's not be that, please, on, on other people. This question is meant to gently redirect our focus. It reminds us that there's more going on than our problems. Something more powerful than my problems is in play right now. I have a God who is my Savior right now. And that's the reason Paul could say, I'm sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. What a strange thing to say. Has he got multiple personality disorder? No, because he knows that he, he's not denying the fact that these are sad problems, but there's something more than that going on. There are positive, life-giving realities all around us. We can't always see them, but they're truly there. 
The psalmist has already mentioned some uh, in his back and forth contrasts. He says, by day the Lord directs his love. At night his song with, is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Day and night, we just sang it. Day and night, night and day, we're going to give our praise to God. Well, the psalmist, and the psalmist earlier said, day and night my food has been tears. Instead of me thirsting, I'm thirsting for God and what I get is a drink of tears, but there's something else going on day and night as well. Then day and night, the Lord is directing his love to us. That word, that word direct means to command. God is, think about this, God is commanding his love toward you, sending it your way with a divine commission to turn your life around. What a great thought that is. God's giving me a song of praise. He's prompting me to pray to the God of my life. So in my prayers, I'm reminding myself the God of my life is the life-giving God who gives me life night and day, day and night. And all of this is happening when it doesn't seem like it, when it seems like God is far away. And so, so the psalmist talks to himself and says, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Now, he's not saying this to us. He's saying it to himself. His soul is the one that's being addressed. I'll put it, I'm going to paraphrase it. Oh, my soul. Come back to your hope and trust in God. Talk to yourself. I'm telling you what, in our self-talk, we call ourselves back into this place of hope and trust, even when God seems far away, even when we don't see or experience him. It's kind of like what the psalmist said in another psalm, return to your rest, my soul. It's a self-talk. Return to your rest, my soul. Why? Because God has been good to you. We talk to ourselves. I will yet praise him. He's my savior. He's still my loving God. No matter what I'm experiencing, he's still my loving savior, my loving God. I'm still connected to him. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. Well, Rick, if I talk to myself, what am I supposed to say? You know, can I just say anything? You know, how can we be confident that we're not just making up our own words, that we're not just pumping ourselves up emotionally? And so here's my last point. Say what God says. Say what God says. Hebrews chapter 13 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So... As a result of that God has said that, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Now hear this, because God has said, we can say. God has said, so we can say. We say what God says. I'll put it to you this way. Whatever God says about us, we can say about ourselves with confidence, with boldness, and with courage because God said it. We're not making it up. Because God has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, then we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I, I, I tied this in to the uh, five affirmations that I, that I say to myself just about every day, you know, uh, 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 and I've put it this way, that because God says, I love you with an everlasting love, so we can say boldly, I am deeply loved, okay? Because God says, uh, I, am, I have removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. Because God has already said that, we can boldly say, I'm completely forgiven of every sin. See? Because God says, I welcome you into my family. So 1 Peter 2.10, we can boldly say, I am totally accepted by God. I got a picture the other day, it helped me, that, that I'm like the prodigal and the father is running to meet me. He's totally accepting me. Uh, because God says, you're my daughter, you're my son. For that reason, I am pleased with you. So we can boldly say, I'm fully pleasing to God. He's, he's receiving me. God says, I, made all th I make all things new. I've given you a new heart. I've given you a new spirit. So we can boldly say, 
I am a new person in Christ, and I, I'm doing it this way. I'm going to say, soul, are you listening to me? You are deeply loved. Soul, are you listening to me? You are completely forgiven. You are totally accepted. You are fully pleasing. Soul, you're a new person in Christ Jesus. You can find those affirmations on, our, on, our, on myffc.info. I encourage you to use them. I've been using them for a long time, ever since Margie brought that message to us several years ago on a Good Friday. So we say this, I am deeply loved because God says it. But, but then he's saying, my soul, he's addressing himself. And in addressing himself, he's kind of stepping outside himself. I'm going to use this again. In fact, I'm going to put that statement up there. Step out of yourself to speak to yourself. Oh, it sounds like New Age mysticism with crystal and cosmic convergences. Now, he is, he is stepping out and he's looking at himself discouraged and he's talking to himself as that discouraged person. He's got a sort of a more objective view on himself. You know, this, this stepping outside of ourselves helps us to see our situation and our emotions from a more objective perspective other than being in the spin cycle of, of chaos, emotional chaos. In fact, I, I googled, as I prepped this message, I googled, am I, am I insane to talk to myself? And uh, what popped up was not, yes, Rick, you are. You know how Google is, they know everything about you. Anyway, uh, that's another subject for another time. But uh, it popped up all of these uh, uh, um, papers, psychology study papers, and they did a study about self-talk that found that speaking to oneself in the third person or in the second person, which is, oh, my soul, that he's speaking to himself in the second and third person helps people deal more effectively with emotional challenges. And so I'm starting to do this instead of, uh, in addition to saying I am deeply loved about myself, I am also saying you are deeply loved. In fact, I've even said this, Rick, you are deeply loved. And it's helping me. It's sort of a different angle on it. Now, I understand this could be annoying, you know, like the guy Jimmy on the Seinfeld episode who always talks about himself in the third person. You know, Jimmy likes Elaine. Jimmy's not threatened by Elaine. Jimmy can jump. You know, it, it'd be weird if you said, hey, how you doing, Rick? And I said, Rick is doing fine. You go, well, you're weird. Uh, so I'm not advocating that you do that at work or at a restaurant, uh, but but in the, I'm, what I am advocating is that in the quiet of our devotional practices and reflective thought, we can add this, oh, my soul approach to our self-talk. Talk to yourself in the third person. Step out of yourself and speak to yourself. That's what I'm advocating here. I think that's what the oh, my soul thing represents. The last thing I want to say about this, Rick, you said the last point was the last point. Well, you know, when a preacher says, I close with this, you know that, that what that means. Absolutely nothing. Yes. Last point is this. Don't be mad. At, don't be hard on yourself, okay? Sometimes self-talk self is harder than other times uh, just because of life situations. I mean, you see this variation in the Psalms. If you've read the Psalms very much at all, you know that a lot of Psalms start low and end high. Have you noticed that? You know, it begins with, I'm bummed out, where are you, what's going on? And then as you move through the psalm, he kind of makes, makes the turn to God, but I praise you, you're there, I worship you, and I thank you. And, uh, and, and that's great. But, uh, but not every psalm's like that. In fact, there are a couple of psalms where it starts low and ends low. In fact, there's one that starts low and ends <laughs> lower. Well, why would the Holy Spirit put that in the Bible? Because... That's what we experience sometimes, you know. Uh, uh, th those are true laments, and the Holy Spirit's included them on purpose so that, so that we, we understand that, he, he, that we know that He understands what we're going through. There are seasons of grief and discouragement that are going to take more time to overcome. So don't, don't feel bad about yourself, and please don't ever judge another person because they aren't coming out of discouragement as fast as you think they should. It just doesn't help anybody. Well, I've had the same experience. No, probably not. And even if you have, each person's different. You know, the proverb says, only a person's heart can know the pain that they've experienced. And so what I'd like us to do, Warren's going to help us. Let's give it up for Warren. 
Brother, I love those passing chords that you do, man. Oof, yeah. Anyway, we appreciate Warren. So we're going to try this together. We're going we're gonna to repeat those I am statements, but we're going to change them into you are statements about yourself. So here's what I'd like us to do. There's nothing weird. I'm a little bit scared. Just close your eyes. And just, I want you to repeat these affirmations to your soul, to yourself. Say this to yourself. Step out of yourself and your situation a little bit and say these things to yourself. Say it with me and you online do it as well. You are deeply loved. Say it. Say it a little louder. You are deeply loved. You are completely forgiven. You are totally accepted. You are fully pleasing. You are a new person in Christ. Now, God, I pray that you would help us to walk this path the psalmist, through the Holy Spirit, has laid out before us. And in our hard times, in our times of chaos, that, um, that we would pour out our hearts and not hide our hurts, but also not live in them forever. Help us to to talk to ourselves without feeling foolish. We've got David who talked to himself as our example, Lord, and help us to, to find our way out of these difficult, challenging places so that we can put our hope once again in you and, and so that we can say, I will yet praise him who is my Savior and my God. And I pray for those that don't know you, God, as Savior. I pray for those that are living far from you. And I pray you would draw people to yourself by your, by your Holy Spirit, speaking thoughts and ideas into their minds and their hearts. And just with your eyes closed, and if you're watching online, I want to address you. If you've never received Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today, right now. If you're in this room and that describes you, you're living far from God and you know it, but you want that to change, then I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer of faith in Christ and commitment to Him. It'll start you on a new journey. God wants you to be born again. The change will be so radical, it's like being born all over again. And so I'm going to pray a simple prayer that I'm going to ask you to repeat. If you're online, just say it out loud if you can. If you can't, say it in your own mind. Here, we're going to say it out loud if you're in this room and you know this is for you. And say it with us. Church, let's all say it together. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your Son to die for my sins. I acknowledge that I've sinned. I need your forgiveness. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Take away my sin. Make me new on the inside. I will follow you, Jesus, for the rest of my days. Amen.